guest today and you're watching online or in person. My name is Stephen. I'm the lead pastor here at Revive Church. It's an honor to be able to be up here and minister to you today. And if this is your first time, what I want to ask you to do <clears throat> is download the Revive Church app. Click on the Connect section and fill out a Connect form. We would love to hear about your experience. If you're online, you can go to connect.revivechurch.com. If you're walk, watching at revivechurch.live, one of our hosts will put up that link for you, connect.revivechurch.com. We just want to connect with you, get to know you. We want to hear about your experience and how we can better serve you. And then last but not least, before I get into the message, uh, most importantly, I want to thank every single person who has been giving financially this year, who has been tithing, who has been trusting God with their finances. I know even in the midst of a pandemic, it really is easy to go, oh my gosh, I need to hold on to everything I have. I need to store up. And that is wise to do, but I still want to honor my God. I still want to show him my love. I still want to put him first. And so thank you for tithing consistently. Thank you for being generous on every occasion. Thank you for not just being generous in this house through tithes and offerings, but being generous with people you know when the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says, hey, you need to give to this person. Thank you for doing that. We are celebrating because in the month of September, while I was gone on sabbatical, our church gave away $6,000 worth of school supplies to teachers around DFW. And it was an awesome, awesome thing to come back because I kept getting emails of this has been delivered, that has been delivered, this is, I was like, what are all these Amazon things? And they let me know what they were doing. So I'm just so grateful that you are giving because when you give, we get to give. And uh, it is just an amazing thing to watch God because here's what you may not know. God is not, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> man is not your source. Your job is not your source. The government is not your source. God is your source. God will use instruments to put money in your hands, but he only puts money in your hands if he can trust you. He who can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. And I want our church to be able to be trusted with much. I want our church to not just give away school supplies, but I want our church to uh, bless an entire student body with free lunches for the year. And I want our church to build homes for people who are in need. And I, I want our church to buy vehicles for single moms. And I, I want our church to do great things. And so I believe that as God trusts us with this little, as Jesus said, that he's going to begin to trust us with much. And it's going to happen through your hands. It's going to happen through my hands. And so I, I believe that today. Man, I'm excited to get back into Week two of The Stretch. If you were not here last week or if this is your first time, we started a brand new what we call learning series. We call it a learning series because we believe that when you come to church, you should learn. You should be engaged. You should not be bored. By the way, I just want to just clarify something. This is not uh, the church down the street. This is not a whitewashed church. We have some people who have a little flavor and a little color this morning, and so they're going to say amen a few times, and they're going to say, preach it, come on, pastor. They're going to say things like that. If you are a little light today, and you don't know how to blend in, you just listen to what they say, and you can call it out just like they do. When they give an amen, you can real quick, right after, amen, that's right, amen. Okay, just so you feel comfortable, because some of y'all are going to feel real awkward about 30 minutes into this, all right? But I just believe that God has spoken to me about what he wants to do, what he's been doing this year, what he's going to do through the church, big capital C. Every church is feeling this, and it is a stretch. If you have a Bible, I want you to open it up with me today to Mark chapter 2. And by the way, open your Bible. Let me just clarify something. Open your Bible. Come on. Download it on the, the, your phone or something, but get your Bible open. Go to Mark 2, and here's why you need to have your Bible open with me, because we're going to have it on the screen for those of you who just don't have a device or anything to read the Bible on, but you might see something today. The Holy Spirit might speak to you while you're, while you're reading this with me. He might speak to you in a way that is something that has to do with this message or something that you've been dealing with just because you're reading the Word of God. And so you need to be in the word with us. Mark chapter 2 today. And as you're turning there, I want to share with you again a prophetic word that we received from Jordan Fudge who came and ministered to us a couple weeks ago. And um, this was really powerful because it was speaking to everything that God had been downloading to me while I was away. And here's what he said. He said, you've been in a season, Revive, where God has been repositioning you to try again. God has exposed the hearts of people who weren't supposed to be here who didn't carry the heart and the vision of this house. There were people who were supposed to leave. They aren't supposed to come back. I want to clarify something for every person who goes, is that me? If you're here, that ain't you. <laughs> he was speaking past tense. Uh, I want to clarify something for those of you who are online, who are watching in your homes because maybe you don't feel comfortable yet. Maybe you have a health issue and you're not getting out in public. Maybe you just say, you know what? Home is kind of nice to have church and you're getting accustomed to this and the God's moving in your house. 
I just want to tell you something. You haven't left us. You're a part of the revived nation. You're a part of this church. We love you. We are engaged with you. We put this camera up. We invested this money for you. And so I want to say thank you. You haven't left us. So don't be like, oh, he's talking about me. I'm not talking about you. We're talking about, never mind. Anyway. (laughs) And he continues, God is sending revive to the deep. God is getting ready to do something large and great. God is positioning you to try again. He's launching you to the deep to try again. And this was the the strong word that he gave us. You've been in a season where you've had strategies and structure and creativity. Now I give you my word. You've been in a season where the only thing that you lacked is his thumbprint on what you were doing. God sent me here as a sign to tell you that his hand is upon you. Come on, can you say amen to that this morning? God's hand is upon you. Can you say that? Say, God's hand is upon me. And we learned last week, God's hand is upon you, not to massage you, but to stretch you. And if you missed any part of that, you can watch it on YouTube or at revivechurch.com. But I want to read Mark chapter 2 and get right into this, starting in verse 18. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They can't so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins. And both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. I want to focus on verse 22 with everyone here in person and online this morning. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine. Somebody say new wine. New wine into new wineskins. I've got a message title for you today that some of you are going to enjoy a little bit too much and you need to listen to this advice. My message title today is Learn to Hold Your Wine. Now here's where we get honest with each other. Last week's message made some people feel really comfortable about the destruction that they faced and the disarray that they faced in the year 2020. Because a lot of people, when when they heard this message, what they accumulated that message to, what they equated that message to is, God has been stretching me this year. And everything that I've faced is God stretching me. I want to clarify something for you today that maybe that's not true. Maybe it's not that God has been stretching you this year. Maybe it's just you've made some foolish choices. It's very easy as a Christian to say, oh, God is doing something. God will use anything for his glory. God will use everything for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose, according to Romans 8, 28. But the truth is that sometimes we just make dumb choices. And I think there's some people that they've done that this year. Jesus says, you do not pour new wine into old wineskins, because if you do, the wineskin will burst, and the wine and the wineskin will be ruined. Now, my wife and I, we don't drink alcohol in our house. It has nothing to do with theology. It has everything to do with history. My wife was a big drunk when I met... No, I'm just kidding. She wasn't. Um, <clears throat> just kidding. Just kidding before you edit that in. Just kidding. Yeah, the, but the truth is, in my family, we've had a history of alcoholics. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather, or my paternal grandfather was an alcoholic, and I've heard stories, and uh, my dad was a little bit of an alcoholic. I've had family members all through our line um, and, and even through my mom's line as well of alcoholics. And so I just made the decision. I said, we're not going to drink alcohol in our house and, and we're going to break this curse over our family in Jesus' name. And so that's just something we do personally. Uh, again, we don't believe the Bible says that you can't drink wine, but it does say do not get drunk on wine. Okay. Just had to describe that. But before wine cellars, it was customary to store your wine in wine skins. And 
When, when armies would go to battle in ancient days, they would carry wine with them in these, these giant wineskins. If you'd like to see what an ancient wineskin looks like, you can go to my Twitter. Uh, I posted a picture of this, and uh, people lost their minds. We had one of the Filipino, Filipino families reach out to me, and they said, is that a roasted pig? They got real excited. I was like, no, it's not a roasted pig. It's a, it's a wineskin. But it actually was kind of like a pig because these wineskins were made of animal skin. And armies would, would fill these giant animals, they would, they would gut them completely, and they would clean the inside of the skin. And because of the insulative purposes of skin, it would keep the wine fresh. And so they would pour wine, and they would tie it off at the top. Um, I have a wine skin here. It's not as uh, nice as the ancient ones. Actually, it's much nicer than the ancient ones. But um, on the outside, it's really rough. On the inside, it's got a canteen. This isn't actually what they look like. Uh, theirs were just kind of uh, sitting there. There was no inner device to hold the wine. It was just poured right into the wineskin. But as you'd pour, if you don't understand how wine is made, grape juice is first poured into the wineskin. And as it begins to sit and ferment and, and it's insulated by the skin itself, there's a lot of chemical reactions that happen. I was reading about this this week. Sometimes people think that it's just ethyl alcohol that's formed in the grapes. It's actually not. There's a lot of different chemical reactions that happen over and over as grape juice ferments into wine. There's ketones for all you keto freaks. Uh, there, there's fermentation that begins. There's um, uh, uh, electrolytes. There's all kinds of different chemical reactions. And as the wine begins to ferment in the wine skin, the skin has to be strong enough and treated enough and thick enough to begin to expand because the chemical reactions let off gases that eat away at the inside of the skin and, and begin to stretch it. And this is what Jesus is, is talking about when he says that you don't pour new wine into old wineskins because when you let wine sit too long in a stretched wineskin, it's not able to go through the transformation process a second time. And if you attempted to pour fresh grape juice, freshly squeezed grapes into this wine skin, the fermentation process would begin to rupture the skin and you would see tears and eventually it would burst. And as he says, the wine would fall out and, and the skin would be ruined and the wine would be ruined and there's no place in the kingdom of God for those who desire old wineskins in their lives. But this is how a lot of people who have survived this year have become. You have burst at the seams. You gave up. You lost control. You wept like you did back in junior high when that person dumped you. You forgot your first love. You ignored the advice and the counsel of those who love you. You began to listen to any and every negative thought that crept in. You found your comfort in substances, in sexual encounters, and in sin. And now everything that you are hearing from ministers, either your own pastor or your podcast pastor, everything that you heard from these ministers in the, the month of September at Revive, everything that you know from God's word, every word of counsel from wise people who are trying to teach you about the habits that you have, your lifestyle. They're trying to show you you have to turn away from sin. They're trying to encourage you that you've got plans and purposes from God that you haven't tapped into yet. You can't receive any of it. Why? Because you're just an old wineskin that got burst this year. What if it's not that God was stretching you? What if it's old wine? What if it's not that God is stretching you? What if it's you just, you just burst this year? I want to give you three things this morning that you have to do if you're going to learn to hold your wine. Somebody say, I'm ready. I'm ready, I'm ready to hold my wine. <laughs> Mama, you were a little too excited about that. <laughs> do we need to talk afterward? No, I'm just kidding. I'll just play it. I'm just playing. So silly. The first thing you need to know about learning to hold your wine in the kingdom of God is this. Be a wineskin and not an alabaster jar. Be a wineskin, not an alabaster jar. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. In Mark chapter 14, a woman comes in to Jesus. 
He, she sees him and she, the Bible says that she breaks an alabaster jar that had perfume in it and she begins to wash his feet. She pours it over his head and then she begins to wash his feet with her tears, with her hair. And sometimes we, we don't think of ourselves as alabaster boxes or alabaster jars. We don't know what an alabaster jar is. In ancient times, an alabaster jar was made of very uh, expensive stone and and this jar was designed so that you could put things like spices or aromatic things like perfume as this woman did you could pour it in and and you'd put the top on and you could seal it with wax so that none of the flavor none of the, none of the fragrance left that was the whole purpose of an alabaster jar and in this particular case in Mark chapter 14 Jesus is at the Pharisee's house i believe his name was Simon and as he's sitting there the inclination of the story is that this is a lady of the night a prostitute, a hooker. She comes up. She sees Jesus. She immediately breaks the jar. She pours the perfume over him. And one of the disciples, Judas, got really mad about this. And he says, do you not know that this cost a year's wages? I don't know how many people actually have something that's worth a year's wages in their home. Definitely not perfume. Perfume. He gets mad, and Jesus said, if, if you knew, if you knew what I've done for her, if you had recognized that I've done for her what I've done for you, you would love me the same way. When I walked in, you didn't offer to wash my feet. You didn't give me nothing to drink. You didn't ask me if you could hang up my jacket. No, 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 no. You just looked at the, the empty seat at the table and said, that's where you sit. But this woman, because she has been forgiven such an amazing debt, she's willing to give me everything. The uniqueness of Mark chapter 14 is that she breaks an alabaster jar. Be a wineskin, not an alabaster jar. Here's what I mean by that. You can either be stretched by God or you can be broken by God. And as someone who has been stretched and someone who has been broken, I will tell you right now, I'll take stretched over broken any day. Some of you haven't been through nothing. You haven't been broken yet. God be the glory. You're so holy and sanctified. You haven't been broken yet. Praise God for you. But that's not my testimony. My testimony is God stretched me sometimes, and other times he had to break me to get out of me what he had already put in me. There are times in your life where God will begin to stretch you. There are other times where God needs to break you. Some of you were an alabaster jar this year. God couldn't stretch you. He broke you. He said, my hand cannot be on you because you have rejected me. But the good thing about being broken is that when you recognize your broken self, you know that there's only one Messiah, only one Savior, only one Redeemer who can put you back together the way that he had you in the first place. Wineskins are made with the ability to stretch. Be a wineskin because then you can be poured into and poured out of. If you're an alabaster jar, on the other hand, let me just clarify who it is an alabaster jar in this house today. I'm not going to call any names. Some of you got real tense in that moment because you thought I was going to call you out. I want to just call out the characteristics of the people who are acting like alabaster jars this year. You hold very tightly to anything that is put into you. You hold tightly to your finances. You hold tightly to your politics. You hold tightly to your ideology. You hold tightly to your opinion. You don't let God do anything in you. Every time God tries to put something in you, he cannot put anything in you because you are completely closed off. You are closed off to community. You are closed off. You come to church to act like you're a wineskin, but you've been sealed off. You don't receive anything. There's, there's folks we've had in this church for years. They have not received one thing from the word of God when I've preached it. And the reason I know that is because every time God tries to do something, it fails. Every time God tries to put something in them for greatness, for glory, for purpose, for his majesty, they reject it. But eventually there comes a point where God says, if you ain't going to let me in, I'm going to have to allow you to be broken. And if you're an alabaster jar, let me tell you, you can either break it open yourself or you can allow God to do it. But as someone who knows the creator of the universe, I'd rather not have God's hand break me. I'd rather do it myself. 
Some of y'all need to be the hoe that night that showed up to Jesus. You just need to admit it. This is who I've been, but God, you saved me from that life. And so I'm going to break open my heart, break open my soul, break open my mind, break open my habits, break open. This whole transformation is all about you, God. I'm going to break it open. Be a wineskin. Don't be an alabaster jar. Second thing, though, learning how to hold your wine is don't let your wineskin get old. Jesus said you don't put new wine into, he described it, old wineskins. When you try to put new wine into old wineskins, it begins to ferment. The grape juice ferments, and as it ferments and as the alcohol and the chemical reactions happen, the skin begins to stretch and stretch and stretch until it finally bursts. Don't let your wineskin get old. You have to take care of your wineskin. You have to make sure that you're spraying. I had a leather or a suede jacket one time, and when I bought it, the retail agent said, you need to spray this chemical on it every couple weeks. It'll keep moisture off of it. It'll keep it looking fresh. And it did for years. I had that thing for years. you got to take care of your wineskin. Say, Stephen, what is my wineskin? Your wineskin is everything that you are. There's some people, God can't pour into you because you've got old mindsets. And if God, God would blow your mind with the truth if you dared to let it in. We, we can't allow the things of God into our lives. We fight them, we lie, and we say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. You ain't no Christian, you're a liar. You are bounded to old bondages. You are bound to old capacities. You are bound to old mindsets. Maybe God will not do the thing that you are asking him to do because he knows you still have an old wineskin, and if he poured himself out into you, it would burst you. Maybe, just maybe, God cannot answer your prayer because if God answered your prayer the way you want the prayer answered, it would completely destroy you. Maybe you're the person that has God asked God to do something, and when he did it, it failed, and you blame God. Can I tell you something? God's not the wineskin. You are. He said, when I pour out new wine into an old wineskin, and the old wineskin breaks, guess what happens? The wine gets ruined just as much as the wineskin. God didn't ruin anything. God did exactly what his purpose was. Is your old, stanky wineskin that ruined the wine? Don't let your wineskin get old. See, what does that mean? How do you do that? And what does that look like? Because I've got old mindsets and I'm. I, I'm holding on to old angers and old bitterness and old unforgiveness. And I'm, I'm holding on to old situations. You know you're an old wineskin when every time someone tries to correct you, you try to bring up what happened to you 20 years ago. And use that as the same old excuse as to what's happening in your life today. You've had 20 years, 20 years, 20 years to get rid of that old wine. 20, 20 years. But you don't know what happened to me growing up. I don't. I empathize with you. But there comes a point where you hear enough about the transformative power of the Holy Ghost that you either surrender or you keep using the same excuses. God says, step out, start a business. I can't do that. I started a business one time and it failed and God, I did all the wrong things. This is going to happen again. Excuse after excuse, old wineskins, old wineskins. Speaking the same things that people spoke over you growing up. Speaking the same lies of the devil. The, the more that's in your head, the devil keeps speaking things and negative thoughts keep coming up and, and you, you keep just repeating them over and over. It's just old wineskins, old wineskins, old wineskins, old wineskins, old wineskins. Don't let your wineskin get old. Here's why. Because number three is this. Because God can only stretch what is first renewed. God can only stretch what is first renewed. Renewed in the, in the Bible, in the, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, um, wine is a symbol of the Holy Ghost. Wine is a symbol of His Holy Spirit filling the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We said last week that God's hand is upon you to stretch you, not to stretch you for more of what He has, but to stretch you for the most of what He has. 
God said, I want to give you the fullness of his power, the fullness of his presence, the fullness of his provision. He didn't say, here's a little bit. You can have as little or as much of God as you want. It's your choice. But God cannot stretch anyone who is not first willing to be renewed. How do I know that? Because Jesus says, you do not put new wine in old wineskins. If Jesus said he does not pour new wine into old wineskins, it tells me that God is not trying to pour into you anything that you are not ready to receive. God can't stretch anything that hasn't been renewed first. Why? Because if you still have an old mindset and God begins to battle truth with it, if God begins to pour in his word into it, if God begins to pour grace into it, all you do is reject it. All you do is spit it back up. Why? Because every time you hear it, you feel yourself about to tear, about to burst, about to explode, and you go, I can't have this anymore, God. They got mass in the front row. They're good. I don't want this. I don't, I can't have this. This is contrary to what I know. This is contrary to what I've experienced. It's old wineskins. God can't stretch you. God can't do something new in you. God can't really give you the fullness of the Holy Ghost, of his power, of his fruits, of his gifts, because there's something old in you. And every time you feel the presence of God, God begins to try to stretch, but you feel the rip. And when you feel the rip, you stop him. Nope, can't have that. Before we can receive the fullness, the most of him, we have to be stretched. But before we have to be stretched, we first have to be renewed. I'm going to ask the band to come up. And here's what Psalm 51.10 says as they come up this morning. It says, create in me. We lost this prayer a long time ago. There's some people right now, they are just like, they are messed up because they're so focused on who's going to be the president. Your prayer life has consisted of praying your candidate into the Oval Office. Not praying, create in me a pure heart, oh God. One that doesn't look to the Oval Office as power. One that looks to you because you're on a throne. You ain't stuck in an office signing documents. You sit on the throne of heaven. Created me a pure heart, oh God, that doesn't see someone with opposing views and instantly stereotypes them. That doesn't see someone who doesn't say the right color, lives matter, and I instantly reject them. That, that does not create in me a pure heart. But the second half of what David prays, because a lot of us have prayed that a, a pure heart. We want a pure heart. But then he says something crazy. He says, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. A, a spirit that's grounded. A, a spirit that is renewed to be able to be filled with your presence again and filled with your glory again and filled with your Holy Ghost again and, and f- filled with... Not, not just the gifts of the Holy Spirit, not just Randai Shandai, no, 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 no. Not just words of wisdom and words of knowledge, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He said, renew a steadfast spirit in me. A steadfast spirit is what keeps the heart pure. A steadfast spirit is when my wineskin has been renewed, it's been refreshed. God, transform me. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's no longer about the old man. Why? Because the old man is dead and gone. It was buried with Christ Jesus in the grave. But when Jesus came out of that grave, he gave me a new spirit. David prayed this prayer hundreds of years before Jesus was even crucified. He had a prophetic vision that God was going to create a pure heart and a steadfast spirit. When did we lose this desire for purity. Create in me a, a pure heart, renew, renew. It means at one time I had it. At one time I at one time I had it. But man, I lost it. My wine sat there for too long. It got so old and so bitter. 
my wineskin got crusty. And every time you tried to pour something new in, I rejected it because I knew I was going to burst if you stretched me anymore. David says, create in me a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit in me. If I could quote what I have eight weeks ago, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. I don't know about you. I may be a pastor, but in the year 2020, there's some things I had to repent of. I had to take a month. It took me so long to repent. I had to take an entire month away from y'all to repent. I had to repent. I believe there's some people today, your wineskin is filled with bitterness, with unforgiveness, with anger, with fear, with doubts, with rejection, with things that were spoken over you so long ago, and you just keep regurgitating the same things. Oh, God is here today to renew a steadfast spirit. You were abused. You were molested. You were broken down. You were. It was guaranteed that your life would never be anything. You would not accomplish the purposes that God sent, the dreams and the destiny, and you have held on to that. You said, no, 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 but I'm a good Christian, and I believe what the Word of God says, but there's still old old wine in that old wine skin. And every time God begins to speak dreams and visions back into you, you begin to burst over and over and over. And you say, God, why aren't you doing this? He said, because I've tried it big time and time again. But if I do it one more time, it will break you. And I care too much to break you. So I'd rather renew you. I'd rather retransform you. I'd rather give you a steadfast spirit because I want to pour out into you. I believe right here, right now, we need to repent. That we need to ask God for a steadfast spirit. If you're watching online, I don't care where you are, what you're doing. Some of you are in the office today. You need to go hide out in the bathroom or go in your car today. You just have a mo need to have a moment with God where you pray this prayer, create in me a pure heart, oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me because I've lost it, God. I kicked you off the throne of my heart. I stopped trusting you months ago. I begin to put my passion and my purpose into other things. I begin to trust the media. I begin to trust what I saw on the news. I begin to trust what I saw on social media, but God, I'm returning turning back to you. I know your word doesn't match up with the circumstances right now. I know your word doesn't match up with what I'm seeing out in the world, but I still trust you. So pour into me new wine, renew a steadfast spirit. The band's going to sing this song. It's called Set a Fire. What I'm going to ask you to do is, is if you know that you need to be renewed today, you need a new wine skin and you need some new wine, I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet. I'm going to ask you if you're watching online, if you're at home, stand on your feet. And I want you to sing this with them. It's very simple. It just repeats the lyrics. I'm going to ask you in this moment to cry out to God, create in me a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me, a spirit that stands against sin, a spirit that stands against my past, a spirit that has a strong foundation in Christ Jesus, not one that fights back, not one that regurgitates the old wine, but one that is ready to receive the new wine, fan into flame what you have for me, God.